you will, go ahead and get out your Bibles and, and turn to uh, 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. And um, I know you've heard me say that we're, we're preaching through 1 John and you know we got through the first chapter in two weeks. Well, that's probably the quickest any of them chapters is going to go. So uh, just hold on for the ride. Hold on for the ride because it's going to be a good one. This... Uh, this passage this week is, is really, really dealt with me pretty hard. Um, I know we can, we can make up excuses not to come to church like the cold and the time change. And, and that's why, you know, I, I praise God we have a, a, a lot of you here today. Um, you are faithful and coming week after week. And, and I praise God for that. Today, the, the message is titled, Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance. People notice things about us. They, you know, they're always watching you. People, people are always watching us, whether or not you realize it or not. So as Christians, we should be aware that, that our actions are reflective of our beliefs. Our actions are reflective of our beliefs. So the kind of life we live is determined by who Jesus is to us. If Jesus truly is Lord, we will live a life that is, that is uplifting to His name, that is honoring to His name. One that has a, a high view of Scripture. One that, that we really want to, to make the name of Jesus uplifted. But if we don't have Jesus as our Lord, if we do not view Him as the Lord of our lives, we will treat Scripture like it's unimportant. And, and the commands that God has given us in Scripture is optional. When somebody is, is, is regenerated, when, when they have come to faith in Christ, their life will be changed. It will. The things that were once attractive to them will no longer be attractive. The things of this world the, 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 the things that the world wants to, to make important to everybody through media and through, through advertisement, it, it's sin is what it is. It will no longer be important to us. And every action that we take will be directly related to the exaltation of something. Whether it be us exalting the name of Christ or us exalting the name of Satan through us uplifting the world. So let's read 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. 1 John 2, 1 through 6. It says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the Righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. By this we know that we have come to know Him, if we keep His commandments. Whoever says, I know Him, but does not keep His commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps His word, in Him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we know that we are in Him, Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk the same way in which he walked. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this scripture that you have given us today. God, the fact that we can come here freely and sit in a building and read your word publicly is amazing. It is something that we should not make light of that we should not take advantage of. God, I pray for everyone in here as we, as we dive into Your Scripture. God, I pray for hearts to be softened. God, I pray for lives to be changed. And I pray this all in Jesus' wonderful and holy name. Amen. So we've heard this word assurance before. It, it means that we have confidence in something. So if I was to say to you that I assure you that the Atlanta Braves are going to win the World Series again this year, then I'm, then I'm saying that, 
that this means that I have the utmost confidence that they have the ability to win the games that they need to win to do that. So assurance of salvation is something that we must have a tight grip on in our lives. I've heard countless people talk about how they, they question their salvation. So today we're going to see how John lays out in Scripture how we can have assurance. So the first way we see is that our assurance acknowledges the word of Christ, the work of Christ. Our assurance acknowledges the work of Christ. So John starts off this, this passage by saying, "My little children." So this is not referring to, to actual youth or to, to offspring. But this is a, a term of endearment. This is a, a term of love. John looked to them as his spiritual children. Just as some of us may have people in our lives that, that we've had great influence upon, that, that we look to them as our children because we've just had such a great influence in their lives. This is what John is, is saying here when he says, my little children. And he says, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. So John had written these things in, in chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. That's what he's saying by these things. The things that, that speak of how people will lie about their fellowship with God. And that they do not sin. So John's addressing these things so that people will repent and confess their sins and, and be reconciled to God. That's what, that's what these things are. He's now giving them direction to stop sinning. He says, so that you may not sin. Yes, we will never be able to obtain this perfectly until we are in heaven. But this should be something that we aspire to. To, to live lives that, that are killing sin, that are, that are uplifting the name of Christ and, and killing ourselves because... Jesus is the one that everyone needs to know and not David. But people think that since they have made a profession of faith, that they can live any way that they want. They, they, they have this, this fire insurance. They have this get out of hell free card. They see the sinner's prayer as, as something that, that just makes them good. You know, they're just good. But we should aspire to not sin so that our, our lives are honoring to God. But John had written these things so that we may not sin. That's what he said. He, he is warning us of what would happen. This is, this is to stop us from sinning. Sin is what has separated us from God. So I, I affirm personally what's called original sin. This means that when Adam and Eve took the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which was a direct violation of a command that God had given them, that at that point sin entered into the world through Adam and Eve. And, and, and it has been passed down through their offspring and, and it is now in us. So we are born with this sinful nature and we must be reconciled to God. But we have hope that we are... We are to not sin. There, there is hope that God gives us in this. It says, but if anyone does sin. So, so we know that we still sin. Perfection isn't going to happen. Not, not on this side. Not until we're glorified with Christ. So what do we do when we do sin? Since we do, it does happen. So what do we do? It tells us if, that we, if we do sin, then we have an advocate. It says we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. So we as, as Christians who have confessed our sins and placed our faith in Jesus, we have an advocate. So I want to clarify that this excludes everyone who has not confessed their sins and repented and placed their faith in Christ. See, Christianity is not an all-inclusive religion. Christianity is exclusive. There are parameters you have to meet to be considered a Christian. You are only a Christian when you repent of your sins, believe in Jesus, and follow Him by striving to live a life that is honoring to Him. 
You cannot say that you are a Christian just because you believe in God. And we see that a lot today. People think that they're Christians just because they believe that there is a God. James 2.19 says, You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe. And they shudder. So belief in God does not make you a Christian. In fact, it might make you a demon. That's what Scripture says. I'm not calling anybody demons, I'm sorry. The Holy Spirit regenerating you, giving you new life in Christ, causing you to believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that's what makes you a Christian. And because of this, this causes you to have this desire to live a life that is, that is killing sin, that is, that is honoring to God. That's how we know that we're Christians. And it says that, that, that we have an advocate. So what, what does advocate mean? The Greek word here, I'm not giving you a Greek lesson. I just want you to know the Greek word here is only used five times in the entire New Testament. When it says advocate. All of them were used by John, who was the author of this book. The other four times it refers to the Holy Spirit. But, but here it refers to Jesus. See, the word advocate, it means helper. It means helper. And here it refers to, to Jesus Christ because he is, he is the righteous one. He is the righteous one who is able to step in our place and, and help us in our time of need. To be the helper on our behalf. This helper helps us when we sin. In, in, in 1 John 1, 7, it says that he cleanses our sin. In 1.9, it says that He forgives us of our sin. This advocate is on our side as Christians. He is on our side pleading our case like a lawyer would. Has anybody ever had to hire a lawyer before? I have. They ain't cheap. The, the reason that, that he, is, he is our advocate is He is going before God and He is he is pleading to Him why we shouldn't be found not guilty. And the reason is, is there is someone who has been given in our place and has received our punishment. That is why we are found not guilty. This is why when we sin and, and Satan goes before God and, and he says, well, look at that David. You see that sin he did? He, he needs to be punished. But Jesus steps in and says, now, yes, he... He has sinned, but don't look at him. Look at me. Because it was my blood that was shed in his place. It was I that took his punishment. That's what it means for Jesus to be our advocate. John says he, was, he is the propitiation of our sins. So here's a word that we don't use all the time. I, I think I've, I've used this word before. So y'all have heard it before that I know. But in, in Christian doctrine and theology, we have words that I like to call big words. Words like justification and glorification and predestination. And, and here we have propitiation. Most of these words you wouldn't use in a sentence when you're over at your neighbor's house enjoying a steak with them. It's just not going to come up in conversation today. But as Christians, these words should matter to us. The word propitiation is one of the words that is central to our faith. To our belief of who Jesus is. Romans 3, 23-25 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood, to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. So at the center of, of Jesus shedding His blood on the cross is this, this truth of what propitiation is. The word propitiation means that Jesus atoned for our sins. He was able to pay the price that was necessary for our sins. Simon Kistemacher says, 
that it is a wrath-removing sacrifice. That is what propitiation is. It is a wrath-removing sacrifice. So God's wrath still exists today. It's not something that, that was just the attribute of God in the Old Testament. It wasn't exclu exclusive to the time before Christ. God's wrath still exists today. He has not gotten more lenient with sin as time has progressed. Romans 1.18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. God is going to pour His wrath out on all ungodliness and unrighteousness. It, it, it will happen. This is, the, this is the consequence that everyone is trying to avoid. They do not want to receive God's wrath. So how do we dodge this wrath that God is going to, to unleash on our sin? Repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. That is the only way for us to avoid God's wrath. Jesus, in His sacrifice, He appeased the wrath of God. His sacrifice was enough when He was on the cross. It was satisfied by the blood of Jesus. Through, through Jesus living a perfect life, He lived the life that we should have lived, and He died the death that we deserve. He was the only one that was enough to take our place and remove our sins. But John continues and he says, not, not for ours only, but also the sins of the whole world. This, this verse right here, it shows us that no one on earth is outside of the reach of God. No one is too far for God to save. It doesn't matter if they're the most famous person in Hollywood. Or if there's someone who lives in an in a unreached people group. Like the, the Takistani people in Iran who are 100% unreached. There is not a single Christian that lives among them. But did you know that that's not exclusive to other countries? That we have people right here in America that are unreached? Like the, the Turkish people in Memphis, Tennessee. Yes, Memphis, Tennessee. The Turkish people are 100% unreached. That means there is not a single Christian that lives among them. So, so when we give to the Annie Armstrong offering this Easter, we are providing funds for, for training and for, for people to go out and reach people groups like the Turks that are in Memphis, Tennessee so that they can come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. So that they can hear the truth of the Gospel. That's what our money goes to when we give to the Annie Armstrong offering. But we don't need to misinterpret this Scripture here. It says the sins of the whole world. So this does not mean that Jesus died for the sins of everyone who have ever lived. And I want you to hear me out on this. If he, if he did that, then this means that no one would ever go to hell. If Jesus' blood covered the sins of every man that ever lived, there would be no need for repentance. There would be no need for anyone to ever go to hell. But He died for, for those who would believe. Most of us know John 3.16. It says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should have everlasting life. Jesus died for those who would believe in Him. And those that will not believe in Him will perish and not have eternal life. So to say that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world means that all countries and all tribes and all people groups are represented in the death of Christ. That means that, that if, if a Turk in Memphis, Tennessee comes to faith in Christ, that means that, that their sin was dealt with on the, on the cross by the blood of Jesus. That's what it means when it says the sins of the whole world. So when we look at these first two verses, yes, we see that we still sin. 
And sin is, is it's, it's what has separated each and every one of us from God. But it says that Jesus was the propitiation of our sins. For those who have repented and placed their faith in Christ and turned from their sins and now live a life that is exalting and uplifting the name of Christ, He was our propitiation. And this gives us assurance. Blessed assurance. This gives us assurance. And our assurance will acknowledge the work of Christ. Next, we see that our assurance enables us to follow the words of Christ. To follow the words of Christ. We are all influenced by something. I said that earlier. We're we're influenced by something or someone. There may be someone. We are either influenced by Jesus through the words of Scripture, or we are influenced by the world and by culture through what they have to say. And that is ultimately by Satan. Is my mic on? Can y'all hear me? Okay, sorry. The words that we are listening to are important. They are important. Paul says in verse 3 of this chapter, he says, And by this we know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments. So we all have a longing for assurance of our faith. I think, I think everybody wants to have this assurance. This is one of the questions that comes up quite frequently in churches, is how do I know that I am saved? How do I know that I am saved? I believe if we were in the first century church, if we were to walk around and ask people, are you saved? Do you think that their answer would be, well, well I hope so. Or or maybe, well, well, I think so. No. No, because they had this this experiential experiential faith. In in 1 John, the word no is used almost 40 times. 40 times just in these five chapters. It's because that they had this assurance of their faith in Jesus. Jesus. This experiential faith is seen in how they react. So they reacted to their faith in Jesus by keeping His commandments. Keeping His commandments. Plain and simple. That, that's how they reacted to their faith. This is how we should look at, at ourselves when we examine our faith. Is if we truly know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, then we will keep His commandments. Therefore, if we do not keep His commandments, then that means that we do not know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. I believe that God has kept us here on earth for a reason. It would be so nice if at the moment of salvation we were just taken up just like that. But God's got us here for a reason. We still live here on earth so that we are His witnesses. We are His witnesses. And as witnesses of Jesus, if we are to obey the commands of the world rather than the commands of Scripture, then we will be exalting sin and Satan rather than exalting the name of Jesus. This is why we must be in tune with what Scripture says. We must be in our, in our Bibles on a consistent basis so that we know how we are supposed to act as Christians what we were supposed to believe as Christians, it is all in Scripture. In verse 4, John continues, he says, Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So for someone to say that they know Jesus, but they don't keep his commandments, that means that they're a liar. The word keep in this passage comes with a a meaning of an an idea of guarding. So we are to guard God's commandments. If we don't guard His commandments, then then we're liars. We We are deceivers to the world. Our confession is false. And we must remember that we are representatives of Jesus. 
Christian, the word, the word Christian literally means little Christ. And it was, it was started in the, in, the, in the early church, people being called Christians to kind of mock them, of saying, oh, you're one of them little Christs. But, but we are the representatives of Jesus Christ here on earth. So our confession must be a true confession. One that says that we know Him, but is, it is backed up by our words and our actions. By keeping the commands that Christ has set before us. So what John is saying here in, in, in these last two verses is that saying and knowing are two different things. I had a boss man that used to say, don't talk about it, be about it. And I think that that could apply to our Christian life. Don't talk about it, be about it. If we say things without knowing, then we are liars. People know that we believe what we say that we believe by our actions. And our actions should be determined by what is commanded to us in Scripture. We have this, this assurance of our faith because of what we know to be true. That word know, we know it to be true. If you know Scripture to be true, then you know that Jesus died for your sins. And for the sins of those who would believe in Him. And this assurance will enable us to follow the words of Christ. Follow the words of Christ. And, and now we see how our assurance causes us to imitate Christ. We're to imitate Christ. At some point in our lives, we all imitate someone. Might be a good thing. Might be a bad thing. But we all imitate someone. And it's because we, we agree with or we hold this person to a, to a high regard. We respect them greatly. So we want to do things like them. We want to be like them. Oscar Wilde said that imitation is the highest form of flattery. Imitation is the highest form of flattery. I think he got this from Paul. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Be imitators of me as am I of Christ. Imitate me like I imitate Christ, is what Paul is saying. So imitation could be a good thing or it could be a bad thing. Like I said, you have this choice to imitate Christ, and this comes from, from a desire of the Holy Spirit in you to, to imitate your Savior, to, to tell people about Jesus Christ, to know Scripture, to see how Jesus walked on this earth, what He said, what He did. We imitate Him because of the, this desire that the Holy Spirit has placed in us. He says in verse 5, but whoever keeps His Word, to keep His Word means that we are going to continually obey and, and do the commands that Jesus has, has told us. Keep, the word keep, indicates a pattern or a, or a habit. And to keep this, His Word means that we are making a pattern or a, or a habit of, of obeying, of, of doing what Christ has commanded us in Scripture. This is the argument to, to verse 4 in chapter 2 when it says that if you say that you love Him but you don't keep your commandments, that you are, keep His commandments, that you are a liar. This is the alternative to being a liar. And, John, and John's laying it out for us here in, in verse 5. He says, But whoever keeps His Word, in Him truly the love of God is perfected. Who doesn't want to, want to love, want, want, want God's love in them perfectly? They, they want the love of God in them perfected. If you are truly a Christian, this, this should be your desire. To have the love of God in you perfected. If we keep His Word, then our love towards God will be perfected. That's what, that's what John told us. So how we view the Word of God ultimately will show if we love God or not. 
How we view God's Word will show people if we truly love God. So if we, if we truly love God, we will have a high regard for Scripture. We will affirm that Scripture is inerrant, that it's infallible, that it is authoritative, and it is sufficient for all of our needs. And vice versa. If you do not truly love God, then you will not have a high regard for His Scripture, for His Word. That's why it describes some people as liars. My grandma used to say, liars don't go to heaven. <laughs> you might can say there's some biblical evidence of that. <laughs> they claim to have fellowship with God, but they continue to walk in darkness. If they had a high regard for Scripture, then they would have this, this fellowship. They would, they would walk in the light as God is in the light. That's how we truly know if people are Christians. The modern church today is filled with the opposite though. They claim to be Christians, but in their actions they show us that they truly are not. That they do not have a, a high regard for Scripture. They do not... Respect the commands that God has given us. For some, some of the church, Sunday mornings is the only time that they interact with Scripture. They pick up their Bible, they bring it to church, and then when they get home on Sunday afternoon, they put it on the coffee table, and that's the last time they touch it until the next Sunday morning. My prayer for Emmanuel Baptist Church is that we are filled with God's Word. And you cannot be filled with God's Word with me up here talking to you once, maybe twice a week. You will not be filled with God's Word. If you're the person that, that does not interact with God's Word except on Sunday mornings, I don't, I don't want to put you down. I want to encourage you. This is, this is me encouraging you. Because this would be for an extremely long time. I was convicted of this and, and, and I did something about it. I started reading my Bible on a regular basis. And, and with that, I prayed for God to put the desire in me to want to know His Scripture. And with this, it, it grew my relationship with Him. I, I got this desire and I, I was able to learn and, and, and understand Scripture the more that I read. And like I said, I, I want every one of us here at the Baptist Church to be like that. So I have a challenge. This is separate from the sermon. I have a challenge. There are five chapters in the book of 1 John. Five chapters. And we're going to be in this, this book for several weeks. I'll just put it that way. Several weeks. So I want to challenge you to read a chapter of 1 John each day. Monday through Friday. Chapter 1 on Monday, chapter 2 on Tuesday, so on and so forth. And I think that by the time that we finish going through 1 John here on Sunday mornings, that, that there will be many of us that, that have memorized parts of this book. That we have truly put it into our hearts. That we, we truly know what God is saying in this, chap, in this chapter of the Holy Bible. In, in this individual book that, that John has written here. That's my challenge. And I'm going to do it with you. I'm going to do it with you. So if we keep the commands of God and our love for God is perfected, then by this we know that we are in Him. We know that we are in Him. Here again is this theme of, of assurance. Christians want to be assured of their faith. Another way that we we have assurances is right here. Look at how you regard Scripture and you will know if He is in you or not. I'm sorry, if you are in Him. If you are in Him. I misspoke. And I will just say this, that if you have prayed the sinner's prayer or if you have, if you have made a public profession that you were saved and then you continue to live in rebellion, if you continue to have sin in your life that is unrepentant, 
then you have made a false profession. You are what Scripture calls a liar. And I, I, want, I want you to, to know that this is alarming. This should be a huge red flag for you. I believe in this thing called the perseverance of the saints. So, if you have truly been saved by God from your sins, then you will have this desire to be a follower of Christ. You will desire to know His, His Word. You will desire to, to tell people about what God has done in your life. Yes, we are still sinners. And, and even though we still have this sin in our lives, because of this, this salvation, this, this regeneration that the Holy Spirit has done in our lives, we will not forsake our Savior. We will not forsake our Savior. We will not step away from our faith. If you step away from your faith, then you never had it to begin with. 1 John 2.19, it says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they, were, that they all are not of us. True believers will continue in the faith. They will not forsake their Savior. John continues in verse 6. He says, Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way which he walked. So we have four books in the Bible that, that give us great detail of the life of Christ here on earth. We have accounts of his actions and his character. So we have a, a good general idea of of how Jesus would react in certain situations and, and what He might say even. But we are to emulate Christ in our lives. We, we do this with our actions and our speech. People will be able to see our hearts through how we react in situations. They will know if our heart is true if we do what we say we're going to do on a consistent basis. Jerry Vines, in his commentary on this passage, tells a story of, of an evangelist from years ago. He says it was back in the day when they had enough religion to get happy in services. I thought that was funny. And they would, and they would shout during services. So this evangelist, he would appoint a shouting committee to these services. And, and if someone would shout in the meeting, he would have the committee go and follow them around for the week after. And if their life did not portray the life of a Christian, when they were to come back to the next meeting, then they were not permitted to shout anymore. But if your life was that of a Christian, if you truly lived out the, the life a Christian should live, then you were, you were able to shout. You, you could continue to shout. Now, I don't know that we need to be shouting. I have enough shouting at my house with my nine-year-old. So, Christianity, though, it is, it is more than lip service. John 14, 15 says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Those are straight from the mouth, that is straight from the mouth of Christ. You can say things all day long, but until you back them up with your actions... They're just empty words. Like I said before, don't talk about it. Be about it. So if we are to say that we are abiding in Christ, then our actions should imitate Christ. And we will know how to imitate Christ if we know how Christ was. And, 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 we, are, and, and we know that because of being in Scripture, because of, because of our daily Bible study. So when we are in Scripture and we see what it says, we will have this assurance. We'll have what I believe is called blessed assurance. And this assurance will cause us to imitate Christ. We will imitate Christ. So John's had a lot to say in these six verses. These, these are very important to us understanding what authentic faith it truly is. We are not able to show that we have authentic faith if we do not have assurance of this faith. So my question to you today is, 
is do you have this assurance of faith? Maybe you used to feel like you have it, but, but here lately you just don't feel so sure about it. Maybe you've wrestled with this feeling of, of uncertainty because you've never had this assurance of faith. Don't feel like this is anything that nobody has ever dealt with because at 20 years old, I did not have this assurance of faith. I would go to church, but I had no desire to live a life that was honoring to God. I had no desire to be in God's Word. I didn't show any fruit in my life. And this was alarming to me. And, and at the age of 21, God convicted me of this. God showed me my sin. And He showed me that, that it had separated me from Him. There was no connection between me and God because sin had separated us. At that point, I repented of my sins and followed Jesus. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you have never had this, this experience. We talked about experiential faith. Maybe you've never had this experience. You don't have this assurance because you've never repented of your sins and believed in Christ. I want to tell you that there is no better day than today to do that. If God is planting this conviction upon your heart, then you need to respond. You need to repent of your sins and place your faith in Christ. We're going to close in song and I will be down here. If, if this is you today, if you want somebody to, to pray with, to talk to, please come tell me. If you're too shy to do it, if you don't want to, if you don't want to make a big deal, come talk to me after service. I would be glad to talk to you about this. Heavenly Father, I thank You for Your Word. God, I thank You that, that nearly 13 years ago, You convicted me of my sins and, and, and I was able to repent of them and place my faith in You. God, I pray that if there is no one in here, if there is someone in here that has never done that, God, that you would regenerate their heart, that you would place this in them, that, that they would repent of their sins and follow you. Not that they would pray a prayer, not with, that they would walk an aisle, but God, that they would truly repent of their sins and place their faith in you because they cannot save themselves. God, I thank you for, for molding my heart, for softening my heart through this text this week. God, I pray that it changes lives in this congregation today. God, we're nothing without you. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.